So good evening again, everyone. Just by way of review, as we get into the study here on the harmony of the Gospels, last time we covered um, Monday before Christ's death, of course, dying on Wednesday. And on Monday, he gave the parable of the ten virgins, parable of the talents, parable of the sheep and goats. Those three um, are three of the last four. There's one more parable recorded to come. After that, late afternoon on Monday, Christ was gathered once again with his disciples still, and he gives them once again um, the insight for telling them of his death and resurrection to come, his crucifixion. <clears throat> and then we come now to a flashback, if you will, where we pick up is Matthew 26, uh, 6 through 13, Mark, thir uh, excuse me, Mark 14, verses 3 through 9, and John 12, the first eight verses. Um, most commentaries agree this section seems to be a flashback probably to the previous Thursday. And um, one of the questions I have that I sent out is why would the gospel writers place this account here at a chronological order? So this would go back to ABIB 9, roughly five days earlier, most seem to think. And the answer to that question is that it seems that they did this flashback, if you will, um, because the next section that we'll get to is the account of Judas conspiring with the Jewish rulers to betray Christ. And so this section seems to be setting up, if you will, more directly the story that will follow this the account that will follow this. So that seems to be why it's out of chronological order. And so to begin in Matthew's account, verse six, 26, verse six, it says, now Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper. And again, Bethany was only a few miles east and a little south from Jerusalem. And oftentimes when he went to Jerusalem, he would retreat to Bethany mostly because he didn't want to early in his ministry provoke the Jewish authorities to act before the right time. But also in Bethany is where Lazarus, Martha, and Mary lived. So in this account, he's at the house of one named Simon the leper. We don't know who this Simon is outside of this account, but a leper would have been cut off from the community. He would not have been allowed to intermingle. It was a very contagious thing. So it seems that this Simon was healed at some point, but he was still known as the leper, which was not uncommon. People would be given almost a surname for something notable. In fact, later that's where many surnames come from in the European context with Smith means someone who makes something, whether it's goldsmith or a blacksmith, you know, those names would be shortened um, or some characteristic, even my last name, Dowd means dark haired one um, compared to other Irish. And so this Simon the leper is there, but it also is that we find out that Martha and Mary and Lazarus are in, the, in this uh, setting as well. So if we move over to John's account, John 12 and verse one, it said then Jesus six days before the Passover, and this is how we know when it's back to the previous Thursday, uh, where Lazarus was, who had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. Verse 2 of John 12, there he made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. So we have the context here. Mark's account says essentially the same thing as Matthew's account as it begins. But in Matthew 26, verse 7, we're told that a woman came to him. So, But we know from John's account that woman was Mary. So a woman uh, came to him having an alabaster flask of very precious ointment and poured it on his head as he sat at the meal. Um, alabaster was a very um, soft stone that could be carved into a lot of things. It was not uncommon for it to be carved into a container, especially if there was something precious or expensive that was being stored in it. Um, it was easily broken. And so as it says in uh, 
Mark's account, Mark 14, verse 3, that she broke the box to open it. It was easier just to go ahead and break it. Um, alabaster, as I have there in my note, is like marble, but as I said, more easily carved. And so Mary comes with this, and we find out from John's account, John 12, verse 3, that it was spikenard. Now, spikenard is the English word. I won't try to pronounce the Hindi word, but this um, oil was much like what we would call today a, an essential oil. So not perfume, as some translations have it in a modern context, where you have other oils that act as carrier for the scents. This is a pure oil. And this oil had a very strong and distinctive aroma. Because it was not native to the Middle East, it was also very expensive. It came from the region of the uh, Himalayan mountains in what is now known as India. Um, there are some other areas within that region where this plant will grow, but spikenard being very expensive to obtain also became symbolized as the best that someone could offer, but also as again, like an uh, essential oil, this fragrance would linger. It would permeate whatever clothing, hair, it would stay on the skin a long time. And so it would be very aromatic for a long time. So in John's account, it says that Mary took a pound of ointment, a spikenard, very costly and anointed the feet of Jesus. So we're familiar with a pound, how big that is roughly in terms of a liquid. And so you can imagine how much this is. So she anointed the feet of Jesus, wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment, which is probably an understatement. Many have made note that anointing the head is a sign of royalty or, excuse me, at the very least, a setting apart like the priests or asking for God's intervention like with anointing for healing. And then anointing the feet is a sign of humility. We had the example earlier, the woman that came and did the very same thing to Christ's feet. Um, so with that as sort of a context, then we move in Matthew in John's account, a generic saying that someone said, why was this waste of this ointment made? From John's account, John 12, verse 4, we know that it was Judas Iscariot. Now, there were two Judases of the 12, so that's why he's always identified here as Iscariot. Um, we're also given this, in this flashback, a reminder that this is the Judas that would betray Christ. Again, that's the next section we'll come to this evening. So going back, well, let's just stay in John's account. John 12, verse 5, it says, Why was not this ointment sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Now, a denarii was roughly a day's wage for a common worker. And so we're talking almost a year's salary of this oil. So put that in whatever context you're familiar with. That's a very expensive anointing. Um, now, we don't know why Judas said this. Was it truly that he understood the cost and realized that more could have been done with it than he thought was worth doing here at this point? Or was it is because we're, we'll find out later that he was the one who carried the money for the group, that maybe he saw it as wasteful and that um, not only could have been better spent, but maybe he was greedy for the money and that maybe he could have used it himself in some way, sort of skimming, if you will, off the pot. Um, and it says at the verse 5, they murmured. So it's not just Judas making this account. That's Mark 14, verse 5. They murmured. We don't know who the they is. Obviously, others who were there, perhaps some of the disciples, maybe others that might have been in the home. But nonetheless, it was not accepted for what Mary gave it for. We are told in John's account, 12 verse 6, that Judas didn't say this because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief, had the bag, and bore what was put therein. Again, that he could have skimmed off of that himself. So let's move over to 
Ma uh, Matthew's account at this point. So Matthew 26 and verse 10, it says, and Jesus understood this. He said to them, why do you trouble this woman? For she has done a good work upon me. For you will always have the poor with you, but me you will not always have. For in that she has poured out this ointment on my body, she did this for my burial. Now, whether she understood that she was doing it for that, Christ connected it that way. Um, she obviously did this out of respect and love to honor Christ. Um, it was something of value that she was giving, if you will, to him. And so um, Christ is making this statement to the group, basically, you know, stop your complaining. There's another reason behind what she did here. She's preparing my body, which was very common. We'll see much later, not tonight, but in, in future Bible studies, that upon someone dying, the body would be washed. It would be um, anointed, if you will, uh, covered with some oils. The body would be wrapped. It would be entombed. Um, so this was a common practice. She just did it before he died, as Matthew account says. So in verse 13, continuing Matthew 26, so verily or truly I say to you, wherever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there shall also be this, what this woman has done, and it will be told for a memorial of her. So what was probably seen by Mary as a small act, if you will, a very private thing to honor Christ from her perspective, now becomes part of her legacy, if you will, down through time. Um, so, just making sure I'm not missing any of my thoughts here. Okay, so, as I mentioned earlier, you see this box here, the flashbacks probably setting up the story to come. And then I have the footnote here of the spikenard that I went through earlier. The one thing I didn't cover here is that spikenard is only other, only mentioned in another spot in scripture in Song of Solomon. So it was a spice that was well known and used for a very long time. Um, and then also some have speculated that Mary had this spikenard as a dowry or an inheritance. So again, I think Average salary here in the U.S. is somewhere around the low 50s, 50,000. Um, so think of it in terms of how valuable that would be. And it was typical in mid Middle Eastern marriages that the, the wife was to bring something of value from the family to the marriage. Um, she didn't seem to have been married at this point, And so it might have been an inheritance towards marriage. But whatever the case was, she saw Christ as being worthy of this, and she was willing to give it all to him. So now we come to Judas' betrayal. So the next section here is Judas conspires with the rulers to betray Jesus. So we've moved into Monday night, and remembering how God counts days, Monday night is the beginning of the next day. So we're at Abib 13 as we come to the calendar, if you will. Um, so Matthew, um, well, let's read L Luke's account. I'll probably bounce back and forth. Luke 22 and verse three, then it says, Judas entered, excuse me, Satan entered into Judas, who was also called Iscariot, who was counted with the 12. So not only did Judas have this attitude or characteristic where he was greedy for the money he was probably skimming already funds off the group what you know donations were given to them to pay for expenses as Christ traveled around the countryside um, he had set himself up by not guarding his mind to allow satan to enter him we'll come back to a thought there in a moment but um it says, he went away and talked with the chief priests and the captains about how he might deliver him to them, Christ, how he might deliver Christ. If you remember in the last time we went through this, it said that the, the authorities sought to take Christ, but they wanted to do it 
they feared to do it because of the multitudes. So they were looking for an occasion when they could take Christ and they could have him put to death when the crowds would not be immediately aware of what was being done. By the time anyone started paying attention, it was pretty much a done deal. And so Judas goes to conspire with them. So if we move over, I'm sorry, it was at the end. I didn't finish the thought there in Luke 22 because that's where it says it. Luke 22, verse 5, they were glad. They agreed to give him money. He consented and sought an opportunity to deliver Christ to them. Notice, in the absence of the multitude. So moving over to Matthew's account, Matthew 26 and verse 15, this is what he said, Judas, when he went to the Jewish authorities. What are you willing to give to me that I should deliver him to you? Um, he was involved. This is not just a casual thing. Um, he asked the question, what is Christ's life worth to you? And they said they weighed out. This is Matthew 26, 15. I'm sorry if I said the wrong thing in a moment ago. It says they weighed out for him 30 pieces of silver. And so the question for this section is, what's the significance of 30 pieces of silver? And the significance is that it was the price of an injured slave. In the Old Testament, slavery was not as we typically think of slavery as it's commonly practiced even to this day where you own somebody. Slavery was usually what we would call indentured servitude. You owed a debt, you couldn't pay it, you worked for the family to pay off that debt, and then you were released. At the very least, you were released every seven years at the, ju uh, the Jubilee. Um, so it's significant that they only valued Christ's life as the value of a slave that was injured. Very low amount, if you will. And so it says, verse 16, from that time, he sought opportunity to betray him. Um, so we have several things happening here. We know from Zechariah 11, verse 12, that, that he would be purchased, if you will, in this way. Um, in Mark's account, verse 11 of chapter 14, it said how he might conveniently deliver him. And it's worth noting that this is this is a day before the Passover. So 31 AD, Passover began Tuesday night because Thursday, Wednesday night, Thursday was the first day of unleavened bread. So we'll we'll come to the Passover uh, aspects here just a little bit, but it shows you the state of mind of Judas. He was not thinking like the others. He wasn't certainly thinking like Christ, and many have pondered why. Now, we know that he didn't think of the poor, as we read earlier. He wasn't concerned for others in that regard. Some have speculated and wondered if maybe Judas did this um, as a way to sort of provoke Christ, that maybe he was upset looking for Christ to be more of a physical Messiah, delivering Israel at the time, Judah, Maybe he thought if he put him in this position, he would uh, rise up. I mean, again, in a little bit here, we'll see that Christ told the disciples to buy some swords, um, that he would defend himself from the Jewish authorities, that he would, you know, begin this rally, if you will, to throw off the Roman authorities. Um, maybe he thought he could just sort of take the money and not follow through with delivering Christ. We don't know. A lot of possibilities here, um, but nonetheless, again, and making note at the end of Luke's account there, 22.6, that um, the Jewish authorities had deliberate will and intention here. They were wanting to take Christ secretly. So then we move to the next section, and here then um, is the daylight portion of Tuesday on the 13th of the first month. And Christ instructs Peter and John to go prepare for the Passover later that evening. So um, let's read Matthew's account and I'll move over and highlight some other things as we go. So Matthew 26 verse 17 says, The first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying to him, Where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? 
So in this section, that's the first question, and that is, why does it say the first day of unleavened bread when it's not yet when those days fall? And the answer is that even in this time period, moving down to even today, the Jews talk about Passover and unleavened bread as one event that takes place. So if you look even on modern calendars, uh, when it comes to um, what would be the 15th of April, you'll see on most calendars that night, it'll say Passover, and they intend the whole week. And here they did as well. So it's not literally the 15th, because we know the events to follow show that it's not the 15th, but they collectively put it together. And we do a similar sort of thing with events that are close and we just call it by one event. Um, even for us, we talk about Feast of Tabernacles. We don't oftentimes say Feast of Tabernacles in the last great day or eighth day. We just talk about that whole week, eight days as one event. So continuing in Math, Matthew's account, then verse 18, he said, go to us to the city, Jerusalem, to a certain person and tell him, the teacher says, my time is at hand, I will keep the Passover at your house. Now we know from Mark's account and Luke's account, what he also told them was not just a certain person, but to look for a man carrying a pitcher of water. So in Mark 14, verse 13, and then Luke 22, and in verse 11, uh, sorry, verse 10. Um, what made that distinctive, and this is the next question, why did Christ tell them to look for a man carrying water? Normally carrying water from the source, whatever pool or stream or other source of water they might have, they, they didn't have indoor plumbing, so they would have to take pitchers, you know, big flasks, and they would scoop the water out and they would carry it back to their home. That was usually the job of, of young ladies or the women at the very least collectively. So to see a man carrying water would be very distinctive. He wouldn't be missed. So it's not just some random guy they were hoping was the right guy. Um, it was specifically somebody who would stand out. And so um, to continue in Matthew 26, 18, tell him, my master or teacher says, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. Um, in Mark's account and in Luke's account, so Mark 14, 15, and then Luke 22, 12, it says a large upper room furnished and ready. And oftentimes, especially in Jerusalem, it was not uncommon for someone to have a second story room that they would have prepared for uh, guests that might come, especially around the holy day seasons, but they could also use these extra rooms for special functions. And so in this case, Christ is using one of those rooms that had already been prepared. We would use banquet facilities or conference facilities now today. While it wouldn't be that scale, it's the same sort of idea where you could let these rooms out for individuals or groups that had events, small events they wanted to take care of. So um, all three accounts there at the end, Matthew 26, 19, Mark 14, 16, and Luke 22, 13, it says the disciples, I'll read Mark's account, went out and came into the city and found things as he had said to them, and they prepared the Passover. Now, remember that at this time, Christ had not yet given them the symbols. He'll do that shortly. But they were still keeping the Passover as God instructed in Exodus 12. And so there was the lamb, there was the bitter herbs, there was the rest. It was much like a regular meal, specific in nature, but it was like a meal. And so they're going to start with that. And then Christ is going to give them the New Testament symbols. So when it talks about the place being prepared, they had to prepare for the meal as well. They had to make sure everything was ready, that the food was there, and all these other things that would come into play. So then we move to the next section here, and that is um, that 
Christ has to correct the disciples once again. This is one of two occasions that are recorded where the disciples I don't want to say argued, that's probably too strong a term, but they, they had this conversation amongst themselves as to who was the greatest. And it's really telling <laughs> that they don't have God's spirit yet because this is what's on their mind. You know, who has the title? Who has the corner office? Who has the reserve parking space? Who's going to be recognized as the man? And so in... Matthew's account to start with, Matthew 26, 20, it says, Now when evening had come, he was reclining at the table with the twelve disciples. Now, evening is an interesting word here. In the Hebrew meaning of the word, evening is after sundown, before darkness. So you have this twilight period, we call it. This is why we start Passover after sundown. It will continue into the darkness, as we'll see even with what Christ did. But it starts after sundown at the beginning of the 14th. And so as you see up there, this is Tuesday evening, now the 14th, because the day begins at sunset again. This is the beginning of Passover. If you go back to Exodus again, it's very clear, Leviticus 23, very clear on the 14th at evening. There is only one evening a day. In the Hebrew calendar, as God gave it to Israel, evening is, the, is at the beginning of the day, not the end, not the time between darkness and the next darkness. Some even today try to make that argument that Passover is actually during the day and that they'll actually even do it towards the end of the 14th. And, and then even the Jews do it on the 15th. There's a longer conversation there I might cover next time why the Jews do it that way. But what we also find of interest is that Judas is still here. He's part of the 12, right? It says he's reclining at the table with the 12 disciples. In Matthew's account, Mark just says with the 12. Luke's account says with the 12 apostles. They're all there. They're all present. So then um, we find here. Uh, in Luke's account, 22 verse 15, he says, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Now, this is a bit of a dichotomy for us looking at this from a human perspective, because why would he earnestly desire to do this, knowing that the next day he's going to be put to death? And the reason is, of course, because he knows what will be accomplished through his death. It was the whole reason he came as a man. The whole reason he stayed close to the Father so that he would have God's Spirit in him to live the sinless life that he needed to become the perfect sacrifice for all of mankind. So in this section, Luke has the longer discourse. So we'll continue in Luke 22, verse 16. He says, For I tell you, I will no longer by any means eat of this again until it is fulfilled in God's kingdom. This is the last time I'm going to do this. Now, he had kept the Passover his whole life. So that's not like this is just the first time he did it and he's not going to do it again. He's not going to eat of the Passover again until God's kingdom is established. And that's also very interesting for those that try to make the argument the law is done away with, meaning for most people, all of the Old Testament instruction. Why would Christ keep the Passover again in the kingdom if it's done away with? Because for the people that will be in the kingdom that have not yet been given opportunity to have God's spirit, there are still object lessons in keeping those things, aren't there? Just like there are for us now. God is very practical. We understand when we're physical, we understand the spiritual things by doing physical types. And then God gives us understanding through his spirit. So verse 24, we, we jump ahead here. We're going to come back to the verses between Luke twenty two sixteen 16 and Luke twenty two twenty four. 24. Luke's account doesn't follow the chronology of the others. So that's why we set that aside temporarily. So Luke 22, verse 24, there arose also a contention among them, which was 
which one of them was considered to be the greatest. And you can imagine this because they would say, well, because I'm like this, or I have this skill or ability, I'm going to be the greatest. And it would go around the room with everyone sort of making the case for themselves. So Christ either hears this or knows this. And he says to them, the kings of the nations lorded over them, lorded over their nations. And those who have authority over them are called benefactors. Now, I've, I started out when we started this Bible study, my pages here were using the King James, and I would update the languages in some language in some places. Um, what I found um, a month or so ago was that there's a translation that's copyright free that's been released to anybody that wants to use it called the World English Bible. And it uses the uh, same manuscripts as what the King James and the New King James used, that is the Textus Receptus. Um, since it is copyright free, I've transitioned to that. So I want to just make a note of that. Um, so the language is not that King James more archaic to our ear um, translation. So this contention is amongst them. He says the kings are called benefactors. And I like that benefactors in this translation is put in quotes because they don't really benefit the people they're leading. That's the point that Christ is making here. You know, we call even people in politics, we call them public servants. But too many times, the overwhelming majority is they don't get in office to serve people. They get in office to serve themselves. And this is the point Christ is making here. They're called benefactors, but he says in verse 26, but don't let it be so with you. The one who is greater among you, let him become as the younger, the greater, the older one typically had the double portion in the Old Testament, didn't he? But even in this context of the culture of the time, the oldest one stood to inherit more or at least have control of the estate once the parents died. So he says, don't be the older one, be the younger one. And one who is governing as one who serves. This is all upside down, inside out compared to what the world does. But this is the service aspect Christ is trying to teach them here. So he says, for who is greater, one who sits at the table or one who serves? Isn't it he who sits at the table? And it just stands to reason. But I am among you as one who serves. So he said, I'm turning that around. It is not the one who sits at the table. It's the one who serves. I, and I'm giving you that example. Now, what's also interesting here as we go through this is, notice Christ's tone here. It's not an angry, condemning tone. He's not correcting them directly. He's stepping back and showing them what their perspective should be. And if they see the perspective, they'll correct themselves is what he's wanting. Because he says here, well, let's just continue. Verse 28, but you are those who have continued with me in my trials. So he's transitioning here. Remember to serve, but you're also the one who's been with me in all that I've done. So verse 29, I confer on you a kingdom. It is Christ's kingdom. So he's giving them responsibilities in his kingdom. He says, even as my father conferred on me, the father has given Christ rulership over all under the father. Christ then has the, the right, if you will, to confer on others under him various responsibilities and honor, if you will. So he says, I confer to you a kingdom, verse 30, that you may eat and drink at my table in the kingdom. And if you were at the king's table, you were the inner circle. That was a high honor. This is why it was so notable, even going back to David's time after Saul was killed, that he had, uh, I think it was Ishbosheth, that sat at David's table. David could have had him put to death, but to honor um, Jonathan, who was the son of Saul, they had both been killed. He honored Ishbosheth by having him at his table. 
So Christ is doing this with the disciples. You're going to sit at my table in my kingdom. And not just that, you will sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And that's rulership, authority over each of those tribes. Now, what's also interesting historically is that after Christ's resurrection, after Pentecost, Acts 2, um, and so forth, as they began to go out to, to their assigned areas, if you will, they each, it seems, went to a different tribe of the 10 tribes. We know that some had different responsibilities that overlapped, and so it's not a hard and fast thing, but they went to where the lost tribes were. They weren't lost at that time. They were called lost because they had left their covenant with God. Over time, they became lost in history, but you can still find them if you want to. That's the booklet we have on U.S. and B.C. and prophecy, and there's much other historical information you can find on that. But they have rulership. So again, bear in mind what he's doing here. He's, he's correcting them for contention over who's the greatest. And he's telling them the greatest is the one who serves. And you're going to be with me in my kingdom, but you're also going to serve these 12 tribes. Judging sounds too harsh. It's more a matter of managing, overseeing, directing. So he's confident of them. Because this is now the responsibility he's not only giving them uh, following his resurrection, but also what will happen in the kingdom, as he says there in verse 30. He's confident they can do this, especially once the Father gives them his spirit. They've been with him. As he said in verse 28, he's been, they've been with them through this whole thing. And we find in Acts 1 when they realized, and this is, I've got several thoughts here running through my head, so I'm sorry. Interrupt myself once again. In Acts 1, they realized this verse here. Luke twenty two thirty. 30, there were going to be 12 disciples, apostles, because one would be over each tribe. Well, now they only have 11, don't they? Judas is dead. So now what do they do? In talking amongst themselves, they remembered probably a point made here in verse 28, amongst other things, that it needed to be someone that had been part of the larger group, if you will, because it talks about many disciples, not just these 12. There were many, many others. And so it needed to be someone who had been part of that group from the beginning. And ultimately, they chose Matthias. Um, Barnabas seems to have been one of the others they considered. But nonetheless, they realized it had certain qualifications, if you will, because Judas had disqualified himself. So there's a lot Kind of packed in here as we unwind this it is unfortunate but a human tendency that they're concerned about title and position and what's interesting is even though they were kind of arguing about that look at the title and position that god did give them to be rulers over one of the 12 tribes each of them to be ruler over a tribe of israel so they they got what they were contending for but it wasn't going to be the way they thought they had to do it because he makes the point very clear here. It's to be done in service. That's completely different from the way the world behaves. So we move next to Jesus instituting foot washing. Now, this was not part of what was given to Israel in Exodus 12. Um, and we'll see that there's great symbolism here. And this is John only now. Um, it's interesting that John is the only one that records this aspect of it. But this is John 13 and the first 20 verses of that chapter. This is now before the Feast of Passover. Jesus, knowing that his time had come, that he would depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Now, you can take that expression, to the end, a couple of different ways. Um, one is to the end of his life, but also that the word can mean to the fullest extent. And so in his physical life, until he died, he loved them to the fullest extent that he could. I mean, just look at what we just went through previously, just up above. Um, 
that's a loving concern for them to correct how they would view governing rulership. And so then verse two, during supper, this is still the Old Testament version. Many conflate the Lord's Supper and see it as only the Passover, but they're still doing the Old Testament. Christ has not yet died. He's not yet given them the new symbols. And so it's this meal that's still taking place. It says the devil or uh, Satan, having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he came from God and was going to God, arose from supper, laid aside his outer garments. He took a towel and wrapped a towel around his waist. So now he's going to show them something they've never seen done before. And again, previously, he just got done going through to them that the greatest serves. And so he's going to give them an illustration of that. And it's going to really... <sighs> Um, unwind them mentally that they don't know what to do with this. They heard the words, but now they're seeing the action. <clears throat> Excuse me, and it's very unsettling at first. Christ is confident in what he's doing in his relationship with the Father, what's going to happen, but where it's all going to end up. He's not worried, if you will, about any of that. He's focused on what he needs to show them now because this is now. Tuesday night, well after darkness, we're moving into the late hours of what we would call a day, the PM hours before midnight. There are a lot of things that are going to happen now, very quickly, in the next day and a half. And he's got to stay focused on the right stuff. So he's prepared himself. He's taken off his outer cloak. He's tied this towel around his waist. And so it says, verse 5, he poured water into the basin. He began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a the towel that he was wrapped with. Now, we don't know how many he went around. There Again, there are 12 of them, right? So how many did he wash the feet of before he came to Peter? Verse 6, he came to Peter, and Peter says to Christ, Lord, do you wash my feet? Peter is still stunned here. He doesn't know what to do with this. Because, again, this act of washing feet culturally at this time was a household servant or one of the young children of the family. This was not something, someone like Christ, who's seen not only as a teacher, but as they understand it, they've even admitted, they understand, they understand and see him as the Messiah. They know who he is and he's washing their feet. So, Peter asks this question, verse 7, so Christ answers him and says, you don't understand what I'm doing right now. I, I get it, Peter. You, you, you're you a little unhinged here. You don't make the connection. That's okay. You don't understand it now, but you will later. So that's the question. Why was Peter so opposed to this? It's this dichotomy, this cognitive dissonance that Peter is experiencing in his head. He heard the words and he sees the action, but the cultural context is still just blocking everything. He can't put his mind around it. So he says essentially to Christ, if we can reword the question, it's more of a statement. Christ, you are not washing my feet. Peter saw this as something beneath Christ. So verse 8, Peter then says to Christ, you will never wash my feet, even though Christ just told him, you'll understand later. Just let me do this. You'll understand it later. Peter doubles down and he says, you will never wash my feet. So Christ answers back, if I don't wash you, you have no part in me. And something clicked in that moment. Because then Peter says next, this is Peter, right? Always in for a penny, in for a pound. You know, he's, he's all in. He says to them, well, then don't wash my feet only, but also my hands and my head. I mean, just do the whole thing then. If you're down there and you're going to do this, then just make sure all of me is clean. Christ responds back and he says, someone who has bathed only needs to have his feet washed and you're, you will be completely clean spiritually and you are clean, but not all of you. So he's setting the stage here for what will come next. We probably won't get into that this evening, but the next section is where we have the account of Christ, or excuse me, of Judas betraying Christ. 
So Christ already knows that's coming. So he says, not all of you are clean. Verse 11, for he knew Christ who would betray him. Therefore, he said, you're not all clean. And it's notable here that even though he knew Judas would betray him, Christ still washed Judas's feet. That says a lot. It's not a matter of them being qualified. It's not a matter of acknowledging anything that they're not. He was still going to serve them. And look at the world, how it's hated God, and especially in our modern context, it seems that they, they just can't get ahead of God fast enough to do whatever they want to do, ignoring everything he's, he says in his word. And yet he still serves mankind, doesn't he? Through Christ's sacrifice, through even just the life that he provides, the, the existence of this planet to be able to live a life, you know, all the things that we have, whether food or water, air to breathe, God still serves mankind, even though they're not much like much different than Judas was. So then verse 12, when he had washed their feet, so he'd gone all around the room, all 12, he'd washed their feet, he put his outer garment back on, he sat down, and he asked a rhetorical question, but this is a great teaching device. If you want people to think about something excuse me, ask them a question about it. Even if they don't answer, they'll start thinking in their head, what, what is the answer? So he asks the question, do you know what I've done to you? It's a rhetorical question because they've never done this before. They have no idea what's going on here. Peter grasped a little bit about it when Christ said, if I don't do this, you don't have any part in me. Peter at least had the, the mind to acknowledge or realize, yes, I want to be a part of you. So he went along with it, but now Christ begins to explain that this is the, the next question here. What is noteworthy as Christ finished? And what was noteworthy to make clear is that he washed Judas's feet as well. So verse 12, I'm sorry, verse 13, you call me teacher and Lord, and you say correctly, for I am. Now, what's interesting is that John especially uses that expression, I am, more than the other gospel writers. Because he's also talking about the divinity. John's gospel is looking at Christ differently than the other three. The other three had a specific audience. John does as well, more of a Gentile audience, but they didn't care about Christ's heritage. They didn't care about what the kingdom of God meant physically, spiritually. He's talking to them about the divinity of Christ. And this I am expression, and the, the Jewish authorities caught this several times. They saw it as blasphemy because they understood what that meant. That's the name God used, Jesus Christ, as we know him now, at the burning bush with Moses. I am. You could tell them I am. The I am sent you. So, verse 14, if I then, the Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet, which goes back up to the previous section. The greater serves, the, young, the older serves the younger. So he says, I've given you a very clear example here. If I've done it to you, you need to do it to each other. Now, some churches will do this. In the Catholic Church, it's the Pope and some of the high up cardinals. And there are a few evangelical churches that will do this. But for the most part, I find it very sad that you have such a clear example. In the New Testament, let's just lay everything else aside out of the Old Testament for the discussion. How many churches acknowledge Passover foot washing and do it? This is the example of service that he's given here. Verse 15, for I've given you an example that you should also do as I have done to you, to serve as he served. Even in this example of foot washing, but even everything else, especially. So he kept the Sabbath. He kept all the holy days. He followed the food laws. He tithed. You know, all of the doctrines that many want to throw away out of the Old Testament, Christ did. And they'll say, well, he came to fulfill them, misquoting that verse in Matthew. All right, 
this is a point of theological logic, if you will, here. Sometimes you can cut through the chase. I had a guy send me a, a paper that he had written, and the whole premise of his paper was to show that we were keeping Passover wrong, that instead of at the beginning of the 14th, it needed to be at the end of the 14th, which really makes it the 15th. It was going through all these hoops about explaining evenings and when the Jews did it and what happened here and there, going through all these verses. And I wrote him back and I said, look, I appreciate the work you've put into this. And it was a very well put together paper. But I said, at the end of the day, especially for these discussions, it really comes down to a simple argument for me. What did Christ do? And I said, when it comes to the New Testament Passover, there is no arguing. He did this Tuesday night because Wednesday night was the beginning of the first day of unleavened bread. They had to get him off the cross, right? The stake before the holy day. That's why the Roman guards were breaking the legs of the other criminals there. They didn't have to break the legs of Christ because he'd already died. But the next day, so this argument about, well, the lambs were killed on the afternoon of the 14th and all of this stuff, it doesn't matter. What did Christ do? Because right here, verse 15, you should do as I have done. I, to my mind, you can't get any clearer than that. Verse 16, most certainly I tell you, a servant is not greater than his Lord, neither one who is sent greater than he who sent them, which goes back to wanting the greater positions that we covered just a little while ago. We're not greater than Christ. So if he's giving us the example, we're supposed to follow it because we don't have authority above him. Neither is one who has sent greater than he who has sent. So he's doing what the father wanted him to do. So it's not that he's not under authority. It's not that he doesn't have to do what the father says because he's God as well. They're in harmony in everything and we are to be as well. And that takes humility. That's why I have that word there at the end of verse 16, humility. Whenever we get crossed up in church politics or doctrine or who's in charge or any of these things that have divided us in the past, it almost always comes down to a lack of humility. Does it matter if I'm in charge? If we have the vision of what Christ is working out, it shouldn't. Because even though the disciples didn't have humility, Christ told them they were going to be rulers. But they still had to learn how to do it. So do we. So to continue in John 13, verse 17, he says, if you know these things, what he just taught them, if you can remember that, then blessed are you if you do them. Um, as an aside, I, I find it interesting. I had this conversation with a pastor that was a great mentor to me for a lot of years. And he said one of the really curious things that he had observed in all of his decades as being a pastor in the Church of God was that eventually, if you're in a, any kind of position of authority, responsibility, title, whatever, eventually God will take that away. And he says it's been his experience, if you will, and sort of analyzing that, that it's often to see if the person is more focused on the position than God. He says, if they're focused on the position, they're going to get angry, they're going to get bitter, and they might even just leave the church. But if they're focused on God, being out of the position, although it might sting humanly, they get over it, they go and serve wherever it is they can serve. And he says, more often than not, God will not only give them back the position, but more. And the example of Job comes to my mind. God took everything, literally, except his wife and his own life, he took everything away from Job, didn't he? But once Job submitted to what God was doing in his life, understood and saw deeper what God wanted him to know and understand, he didn't just get back what he had lost. God gave him even more. That cuts against the world as well. So this is the God we serve. Look at what he's going to give us in the future. In the kingdom, we're going to have everything the Father and the Son have. Literally everything. So to continue in John 13, verse 18, he says, I don't speak concerning all of you. I know whom I have chosen. So this is, again, another uh, reference back to Judas. 
Judas didn't get it. He knew he wouldn't get it. He said, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. And this is quoting Psalm 41, verse 9. And there are some translations that say in Psalm 41, 9, that he has made great the heel. And it doesn't sound like much to us in the English, but in the Hebrew, the expression indicates brutal violence. And then look at what Christ went through. Judas ate the bread with him. Christ washed his feet, and yet Judas set in motion this brutal violence that would be done against Christ for no legal reason. So I have highlighted there, eats bread with me. If you go back to John 54, and I think also 48, I may be wrong on that verse, but twice in that chapter, he talks about being the bread of life. So he who eats bread with me, not just physically, but who also partakes, if you will, of what we'll see here later next time, that the bread represents. Verse 19 then, John 13, for now on I tell you before it happens that when it happens, you may believe that I am, this another time John uses that, I am he. Not just the he of Psalm 41.9, but also the, the he who is the I am of Exodus 3 and so forth. Christ says, I'm not going to hide anything from you. I want you to know what's coming. We know the prophecies even coming down to the end time. Christ has not hidden that stuff from us. We should be very well versed in a general sense what's going to take place so that we can prepare, so that we can be strong so that as we go back to the parable of the foolish and the wise virgins, we're not, I'm sorry, that's to come yet, that we're not caught off guard. So to end this section, John 13, verse 20, most certainly I tell you, he who receives whomever I send receives me. And he who receives me receives him who sent me. This line of authority going both directions. So. That's what we'll cover for this evening. We're just almost at 7.30. Next time, we'll pick up with the account of when Christ identifies Judas as the betrayer.